Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, I, Mark Bagley, am joined by uh, Jose Barajas, um, our technical director here at Attack IQ. Hey, Jose, how are you? Hey, how's it going, Mark? And hi, everyone else. Outstanding. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, ourselves, because, well, that's comfortable and easy. Um, we'll then spend a bit more time talking about some of the lessons that we've learned helping customers in the financial services mm -hmm. vertical, um, specifically around some of the, you know, problems that they're experiencing with their security programs and ways that they're looking to apply um, validation and continuous, continuous automated testing to uh, their security programs. And we'll talk a bit about uh, some of the, uh, the solutions that uh, Jose has uh, been you know, on the front lines developing uh, for our customers. So um, with that, um, Jose, you wanna get us rolling with a bit about you? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jose Barajas. I'm the technical director for the sales engineering team here at Attack IQ. Uh, I've been doing breach and attack simulation, or what we like to call security optimization for the last, I guess, seven years now. Uh, it's funny. It feels funny to say that. <laughs> uh, and prior to that, I spent 10 years uh, basically reverse engineering malware, developing sandboxing technologies. Uh, uh, and that, that's kind of my background. Um, you know, just to give a sense, uh, you know, I think uh, we do a lot of training here. Just to share, you know, I started as a web developer. Um, I actually happen to know Flash very well because of that. And that was my entry into cybersecurity. And as you know, luckily Flash is dead now. I don't know if I could say that. <laughs> but at the same time, right, that was a huge problem. Uh, that's where I got my chops started from a security perspective. And um, love, love the industry, love what we do here, and definitely love what we're doing here at Attack IQ as well. Outstanding. That. That's an interesting and somewhat auspicious way to enter cybersecurity with like the world's most vulnerable presentation layer technology. But um, <laughs> that, that all clicks together for me. And uh, for, for all you uh, watching, I'm Mark Bagley. I'm Attack IQ's Vice President of Products. Um, I've been uh, working in cybersecurity for the last 20 years, but um, I... Uh, I'm lucky enough to have had two different careers in IT, um, starting in operational IT and network engineering in the 90s. And back in those days, there weren't dedicated security practitioners. You just gave your security to the network guy. And hi, I was the network guy. So, um, you know, seeing, uh, seeing the capabilities um, evolve from... Uh, from their infancy into uh, into what we all uh, into what we all operate today um, is uh, both exciting, humbling, and uh, you know there's a lot more for us to do to improve our programs, um, especially with the context of adversary behavior. So um, that's a good opportunity for us to talk briefly about the Attack IQ Academy, and that's something that. Um, I think you can you can get a lot of value out of um, Jose. I know you instruct academy courses. Um, you want to tell the uh, the folks uh, watching with us a, a bit about uh, what Attack IQ Academy is? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, one of the things we want to do here is make uh, the world safer compute at Attack IQ um, and providing training so that our customers or even folks that aren't customers have folks that understand how to apply purple teaming how to do things like apply might or attack, uh, and of course, how to do breach and attack simulation is our way of giving back. Uh, we're all practitioners here. Um, you know, we're actually directly involved in the research with the MITRE Center for Threat Informed Defense. Um, so beyond our experience as practitioners, uh, we're also sharing the learnings that we uh, find as part of that process as well. Things like the emulation plans, um, you know, the NIST mappings that we did and others as well. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's a great place to go and learn about not our software, but really about the practice of threat informed defense, how to bring purple teams together. And the best part of it is if you're um, a CISSP or any other certification that requires a continuing professional education credits, CPE credits, 
um, you can get those for participating in the courses at Academy. Mm -hmm. So check it out at academy.attackiq.com. Um, with that, um, let's sort of shift gears a bit into um, the challenges that we've been observing uh, from uh, the engagements that we've had in the financial services industry. Um, there's, there's a few of, of these that sort of resonate and show up. And Jose and I had a chance to sort of uh, put our heads together about what we thought those were um, that we've seen sort of durably time and time again. Let's, let's sort of run the list here. So the first challenge really is what parts of my program, what parts of my information security program are working? And how would I know? How would I know if my firewall works? How would I know if my EDR is effective against insert adversary behavior here? Finding out the answer to that question is fairly pressing for a lot of folks. Um, another one, how do I know when something changes and it impacts my program's ability to detect or prevent the adversary behavior? So being responsive to the changes that just happen in modern production IT environments. Mm -hmm. Another one that, um, that we've heard many times is being able to mature the analyst processes with MITRE ATT&CK. So folks rightfully want to get more value out of a common language for adversary behavior, which is really the, the genius behind ATT&CK. And they wanna know if their investments in maturing their processes with their incident analysis are actually bearing fruit. Um, we've especially heard a lot lately about budget pressures, folks needing to do more with fewer total dollars in their budgets, be it CapEx or OpEx. And um, the last one that we've heard a lot of is can you prove your ability to mitigate an adversary behavior. Right. Not can you, can you prove it? So, I mean, Jose, those were the ones that we talked about. Um, you know, do you wanna, you wanna flip the table on me and suggest any randos or uh, do we wanna work through this list here? No, I think I think we can jump right in and kind of just work through the list and, and have a little chat about them. Uh, I definitely definitely have some feedback in each of those. Uh, definitely some more stories we can talk about. So, Lyle, let's let's just jump right in. Cool. So, um, how about the? Uh, let's just take it from the top. What parts of my program work, and how do I know? Like, how mm -hmm. do we approach helping? a financial services customer understand whether or not, for example, their, you know, network segmentation actually does what it's supposed to be doing and that you can't directly connect to systems behind the PCI boundary. Yeah, no, those are the kind of things that, you know, I was having a conversation earlier today actually with, with a CISO uh, and, you know, unlike an application uh, that, you know, when there's downtime, <laughs> everyone knows about it, you know, everyone jumps, uh, everyone's getting those support tickets. And unfortunately, we don't have, you know, any feedback loop today when it comes to our security control. So, you know, the way that I think I see it is uh, folks are testing, but it's just not enough. So to your point, they know this area is working, but what are my other 20 sites that I manage, right? My red team can only cover 1% of my topology per month. At most, that's going to be 12% per year. And you're probably never going to get better than those numbers. Um, um, so that's the challenge that, that organizations are facing uh, and, and just having an understanding of when that failure happens is what we don't have today. And that's why we're, we're not able to really answer those questions, uh, you know, to the fullest extent that we would want to. Got it. Got it. it. So, you know, when you think about the, the solution path for, you know, becoming aware 
of a control deficiency and you know totally understood that control technologies fail silently they don't fail obviously that's a great point um how would we you know suggest that someone um who has to you know attest to their segmentation being a certain way go about doing it mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think there's there's two parts to it. I think I think one is being very specific about the expectations. A lot of times the SOC team may not be in a direct, you know, step by step with the risk team, right? The risk team understands if I don't have this network segment in place, I'm not in compliance with PCI and this is the dollar cost that, you know, we're going to have to face uh, as an example. So first of all, having these teams work together, communicating better, uh, I always like to say that concept of purple teaming is not just between the red team and the blue team, but it's between the SOC and the security team and the rest of the organization. Um, so I think that's the first way that um, customers can address it. Uh, and then the second, the second way is, you know, make it as part of the process, uh, right? Uh, uh, depending on, on how your process flows, uh, you know, in healthcare, for example, laptops are sitting for months at a time. That's the problem they're facing. In financial, you're probably more worried about those concentric circles of segmentation around your terminal. Um, so let's go ahead and, and test those key areas that, that are valuable to us, whether it's you know from a direct risk to us as a business or from regulatory compliance that is going to cost us some dollars if, if we don't fix that right away. Uh, you know, making sure that those priorities are in step with what the SOC is doing, uh, I think is the best way to approach it. That's a really good point about being you know, a, a force for aligning those groups as you as you sort of prosecute this goal. And the concentric mm -hmm. circles, I really like that analogy. And, you know, it works too, even when, you know, we're doing stuff remotely because, you know, virtual desktop infrastructure is so common in financial services. Like, you know, mm -hmm. those Citrix servers live somewhere. They have access mm -hmm. to resources browsers run inside those vms so you know right. just because you know the working model that is you know so common right now um moved where the computer is doesn't necessarily move the responsibility of being able to prove um you know in this particular example uh, how segmentation is working Maybe let's move on to the right. next one, which is how do I know when some change is impacting my control function? I mean, you know, I, I you know, it sort of goes to the thing that you said right at the start about like if the service is down, if the order can't get booked, if the trade mm -hmm. can't get confirmed, if the wire can't go out, you know, that's obviously like screaming red, but how do we, you know, create the awareness um, around a control technology that would have otherwise just failed silently? Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind here is, you know, uh, essentially starting to test, uh, you know, essentially on change, right? Uh, we have an established process today at organizations for change control, uh, for governance, uh, ver even down to version updates, right? You can't update that agent unless we know the exact version, what those changes mean. And from that perspective, I think just tying into that uh, process that you're already using today, so that way it's not an additional step, a completely different area, so that, you know, to your point earlier, Mark, right, we have these dispersed teams, uh, right? We have the guys that are focusing on the networking side, guys that are focusing on the endpoint side, others in DLP, um, you know, for our multinational organizations that we work with, that adds even more complexity because, Regulations here aren't the same as regulations over there, uh, right? Uh, let alone the third country that you're operating in. Uh, so that just adds to that other layer of complexity. Um, so defining the expectations very clearly, like we talked about earlier, and now tying into, you know, I'll use the buzzword here, AI ops that you're already using today. Uh, and anytime there's a change, let's validate if those changes haven't affected our security posture. Uh, let's do it in a programmatic fashion. Um, you know, that's that's the only way we're going to be able to keep up, especially with, you know, the complexity of organizations uh, uh, that they're dealing I with. I definitely today. saw what you did there with that little uh, buzzword drop there. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it totally <laughs> makes sense. I mean, being able to 
um, to commission the evaluation of control performance. I, mm -hmm. you know, every time I have a maintenance window, am I capable of testing my segmentation? Am I capable of testing whether or not my EDR is functioning, whether or not, you know, known bad samples can be written to memory or disk, so on and so forth, whether or not these things can happen after, you know, you do a policy update or you update that agent, you know, or, you know, you go through a, a broader maintenance window where maybe you're restructuring certain parts of how you deliver service. Um, but, you know, the message, at least for me, is clear in that being able to continuously execute those tests whenever you need to or maybe just make the tests themselves an automated thing that happens, removing the operator from the decision right. to test can help increase the level of assurance that control technologies are functioning as you intend them to when you deploy them. So let's spend a minute on um, maturing analyst processes with attack and, you know, that being able to tell the story and prove the story with data points of where the value is. I mean, I know that, you know, yes, getting more knowledge in people's heads about how to describe adversary behavior, making, you know, the language of adversary emulation and adversary emulation plans a thing that's broadly understood is all very good, but let's take it out of the motherhood and apple pie domain and let's turn it into like, how do we realize and prove the value that we're getting? Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, from that perspective, uh, some of the projects that, that we've done here support that. And, and, and when I say done here, I mean the, the, the MITRE, you know, center, some of the research that we've done with other groups uh, are going to help with that. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, the attacker myself coming from a, reverse engineer malware researcher background, I very much am very threat centric, uh, right? And, 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 and uh, these frameworks and these mappings that MITRE has developed help us take the perspective that I have and give me a path to quickly translate that so that the business can actually understand what that impact means. So that's, that's one angle I think that's extremely important here. Um, you know, and I think the other thing here, I think it's maybe a little unrelated, but I just thinking about the concept of a threat informed defense is also very important, which is, you know, not only describing these attacks, understanding these attacks, and also actually some mitigation and, and detection strategies, but then, you know, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and which one should I focus on, right? There was 57 of them, you know, last year, do I need to go after all of them? Or maybe these 20 because they specifically targeted a financial organization. Um, so I think those are the two things that come to mind, uh, you know, in this topic no, for I me, mean, Mark. I, I don't know about all, you. That all rings true for me, Jose. I mean, you know, being able to uh, to to contribute back to the community with uh, the public-private partnership uh, in the threat informed um, the Center for Threat Informed Defense is uh, it's pretty important um, for us to continue our mission um, in helping. Um, helping broaden the, uh, the capabilities of defenders um, against these adversaries, but um, also being able to, uh, to narrow in on um, which adversary emulations are most relevant um, is, is a great mm -hmm. way to, uh, to start proving the value of uh, those investments in your people and your processes, um, which leads us to... Yeah, budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More with less. Sure. It's a thing. It happens all the time, every year. You're not going to yeah. cut your way to growth. So if you're not going to do that, how can we make our existing investments more effective? Yeah, and you know, I mean, automation <laughs> to bring that up, right? And everyone says automate, automate everything. Uh, but you know, as much as the things that we understand can be automated, you know, our most successful customers focus on ten to twenty key areas for you know for the month, flush those out end to end, and, and guess what? Now that they've been customers three to five years, <laughs> they have an extensive control capability testing framework uh, that they can invoke at any time. 
Um, you know, of course, some of that is tied to some automatic processes that we mentioned. Uh, but this is the way that we save money. And, you know, those red teamers, uh, let them continue to red team and find those protection failures. Let them exercise their expertise versus writing reports <laughs> or, or putting or going back and replaying it for your team to see whether things are, 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 are prevented effectively. Right. Uh, and, the, and the SOC should be very much focused on, on addressing new threats. All uh, right. Tuning the technologies versus going back and fixing Mimikatz that's not getting prevented anymore, or the iCar file that can be downloaded into the environment, which is probably the extent to which most organizations are testing today you know, in an automatic fashion. Those kind of things are, are the kind of things that, you know, let that simple stuff be taken care of. And you know, beyond that, a solution in this space should then let the red teamers input their findings, whether it's proprietary or not, um, so that, again, they can focus on the protection failure. So, just automating, uh, standardizing, and you know, as long as we lay that foundation of automation, you're essentially just adding things to that workflow uh, that your organization is already used to. So, I, I think uh, the last thought, you know, this is typically, I don't know if I want to call it stage two, stage three, right? But once the foundations of automations are laid down, um, what we're talking about here is where we start to see the value over time. Well, I think you make a really good point there um, around the staging and, you know, you could call it stages, you could call it phases. Really, it's about acknowledging that um, most folks are going on a journey as it relates to evaluating their control performance and testing. And it's not a thing that you show up and decree that you're going to do it one day throw technology down and, you know, say mission accomplished. Yeah. Like, you know, this is a practice right. and it is a new way of managing a program and it is a new way of collaborating with, you know, functions that maybe didn't really collaborate at all before. And, you know, it's not about mm -hmm. trying to prove that, hey, this thing's got more value than this thing. It's about taking the resources that we do have and combining them in a way with evidence to produce a better outcome. And that, like, that, that absolutely sort of sets, sits right, right with me um, and what I've you know, observed right alongside you with our customers. Um, last, uh, last one we've, we've heard over and over again. Can you prove your ability to mitigate? Yeah, no, this is, this is I, I really like this one. Uh, you know, I had, I had uh, someone that I talked to at RSA back when we could actually meet in person. <laughs> uh, and, and um, you know, I think uh, that's like three years ago now, and, you know, GLBA uh, came to them and said, hey, um, what technologies do you use to prevent ransomware? Simple question, you write down the technologies you have, Person looks at it, that makes sense, and, and here we go, right? <laughs> now that same question is being asked, but now, you know, to the point of this topic, prove you have the ability to mitigate ransomware. Those are two very different questions, right? Um, and, you know, is, is doing it once a year? Is it doing it every six months enough when that regular comes around, right? Uh, uh, and how do we actually prove it? Um, so I think that's the challenge of organizations now and say, hey, you, you're managing 150 sites globally, You've only tested in two of them. You know, how much value does this actually provide? Uh, and that's where automation, the scalability um, comes into play and why it's valuable to have, you know, assurance across every firewall that I manage uh, and do it every six months. Um, and I think, I think the last thing here too is, you know, these questions that are coming at us, if we have evidence that we're being proactive um, and as we're testing over time, you know, uh, one of the things I talked about uh, recently is, you know, we're not applying things that we're, we're applying elsewhere and things like, what is the mean time to rumination? What is the mean time to failure? We don't know that because we're not even measuring today. But with that context in mind, those same practice that we're applying everywhere else in our business, I think we can start to apply it in security. And when we show that to that regular that comes back and says, prove you have the ability to run ransomware, and you show them I tested against all the ransomware in the last 10 months, here you go, here's the proof of it that's probably going to be pretty compelling that you're doing as much as you can and, uh, you know, to protect your, your estate. No, I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, being able to, you know, show whatever regulator with whatever mandate, um, 
the evidence that controls exist and that they are functioning mm -hmm. properly and they are mm -hmm. capable of taking action and intercepting known adversary behaviors, which we can describe because mm -hmm. of attack, is the foundation. And right. automation is the way that we do this on an ongoing basis that both A, improves the efficacy of the program and lowers the overall cost to operate and prove that the program functions at the efficacy level that we desire. So definitely makes sense to me. But that's not really just all. I mean, like, if we think about where we could go with this proof that I can mitigate mm -hmm. a known adversary behavior or a series of adversary behaviors, could we not actually turn attestation to my cyber control functions into something that is more of a financial control? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so, you know, given what, what, what we've seen with our, with our customers, uh, right? Um, the risk uh, that not knowing poses to the organization, or maybe if you're an organization that has dealt with something and now the regulators are breathing down your back, um, you know, a thing that we've observed is, you know, now you have to put money in reserves. That's money that can't be used to create, you know, deploy more ATMs or set up more programs or set up additional sites for that you can provide services to your customers. Uh, that is now sitting here. Um, so, you know, being able to prove, uh, like we just talked about earlier uh, with that attestation and, you know, my goal is to have to be just one line in the minutes that it was reviewed and everything is okay, right? That evidence is going to help reduce insurance costs. Hey, look, I'm doing much more than my the other guy is. Uh, kind of like that good driver discount. Uh, that's an approach that some of our customers have taken, <laughs> right? Uh, saying, hey, I have X amount of money in reserves because you've told me to do so. Uh, but I'm now I'm doing this. How about I take some of that down because I'm reducing my risk and I'm validating it. That's another way of being able to, you know, to your point, free up some of that capital and really allows you the business to, to define why they should be able to use that capital. Otherwise, uh, you know, if a requirement has been imposed. Uh, and then actually, we just saw something, uh, you know, today where even uh, um, what was it, Mark? Uh, even uh, uh, loans, right, are, are being affected by. Uh, your security posture as well. Um, so even, you know, loan transactions, whether they're long-term or short-term or, you know, hour-term <laughs> overnight loans that I know you guys do across organizations, this might be a way of also, you know, providing proof, just like we've observed already from an insurance perspective as to, you know, uh, why that shouldn't affect, uh, you know, the APR or whatever the cost of, of borrowing that money would be because you're actually doing your job and you're being proactive, unlike the other guy. So. The uh, the self insurance case that you described first, you know that capital set aside, you know that obviously is a it, that's a very real thing that's happening today, and you know the uh, the interest of uh, of a different class of underwriter in trying to use this as criteria to make intelligent decisions is uh, just another sort of tick in the box the long list of boxes behind um, the need mm -hmm. to pursue a continuous automated security optimization journey. So um, with that, um, any last remarks for our audience here, Jose? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think, I think the, the, the story here is at the end of the day, um, you know, working with uh, different parts of the business, uh, you know, and automating as much as possible. Uh, is going to be a way of, you know, getting away with more with the budget you have today because you're probably not going to get new budget next year, uh, right, or it might be reduced. Um, um, so that's folks that I'm talking to. That's why they're coming to me, uh, right, and are looking for these solutions because they see that uh, as the quickest path to, to, to manage their, their estate in a better way. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, the same automation that's happening in CICD or AI ops today is the same automation we're asking you to apply here when it comes to your security stack is my last comment, I guess. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for sharing the, uh, the anecdotes, the war stories, 
Um, you know, I definitely uh, greatly appreciate um, all the perspective you bring uh, from our engagements all around the world. Um, you know, with that, we will uh, we'll bid you farewell. Uh, enjoy the rest of your program at Purple Hats, and uh, we'll see you at Attack IQ Academy. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. It's almost time for our closing keynote, which I'm sure you're not going to want to miss. Uh, you know what time it is. It's time for another break. So we'll see you back here in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs>